Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to Coding for Beginners, intro to HTML and CSS. I am your host of the evening. My name is Tiffany Webb. I am the director of product marketing and events here at Flatter. A big part of my job is to host events like, like the one you're going to enjoy tonight. Um, and we will have a lovely uh, lead instructor, cohort lead, uh, Candace Peters, uh, as your instructor. So uh, sit back and, and, and get ready for a, a good time. Um, I will say, uh, please use the chat function. Uh, if you have questions, make sure that it's uh, you choose to everyone or to all participants so that everybody can see your questions. Um, a lot of times we, we think that, you know, we're the only one with a question and, uh, you know, we're a little embarrassed. Don't be. Most people will have the same question. So say it what you, say it loud and proud in, in the chat function. If you are a little shy, you can put it in the Q&A and I'll get around to it. I uh, just want you to know that like I am the only person uh, attending to the chat. So please be patient with me. I will get around to all of your questions. Um, if I miss one, don't think that I'm ignoring you. Either drop it back in the chat or put it in the Q&A and it'll put it in, in a list form for me um, and I will get around to it. Um, let's also just be kind to one another. We're all here to learn. Like Josue said, who's ready to code, right? Like we're all here, we're all excited. We're all spending our free time uh, to be here. So let's be kind to each other. Be kind to your lovely instructor, Candace, and please be kind to me. Um, we're, all, we're all trying our, our best, right? And with that, I am going to pass the mic over to Candace Peters. She will take you through the course. Candace, it's all yours. Hey, everybody. My name is Candace. I am a cohort lead here. I'm going to go and share my screen for everybody. All right. Can everybody see my screen? I got it. Yeah, I think we're good. Excellent. Cool. Well, like I said, um, just to give you a couple heads up, I am recovering from bronchitis right now. So if I'm coughing during the presentation, that's why I apologize in advance. And I do have two little itty bitty dogs that get excited around this time because that's when people are coming home. I'm from Chicago and this is around that time people are coming home from work. So if you do hear some barking in the background, that is what it is. <laughs> so um, a little bit about myself is I am a cohort lead here before I worked at Flatiron. I was a teaching assistant at Harold Washington College, where I taught digital multimedia. Um, I loved it. It was kind of like teaching people Photoshop, um, Illustrator, things of that nature. And it really got me into technology. And I loved coding so much and doing the CSS aspect of it that I made uh, the jump and decided to go to Flatiron School. Um, I graduated from Flatiron School with the certificate in software engineering and shortly after became a cohort lead here. I've been working here a little under a year. So just a little bit about myself. Um, so let's talk about what we're gonna be doing today. So today I will be introducing you to HTML and CSS. As with any new topic, there is much more to learn than can fit in a single lesson. So my goal here is to give you a sense of the basic concepts involved with putting together the building blocks of a website. So I am gonna drop something in the chat right now. And what I'm gonna be dropping in the chat is gonna be what we're gonna be working off of today. I'll drop it again later, but I just want to put it in here now. We're gonna be working with something called Code Sandbox today, but I just wanna get it ready for you all. So let's go over our agenda for today. So our agenda is we're going to talk about codes and box, which is what I was just telling you about, how to use it. Um, we're going to talk about HTML, CSS, how to style content with vanilla CSS, talk a little bit about the box model demo, and we'll do a little wrap up at the end. So let's talk about um, my goals for you today. So what we can work on today. So we're going to create HTML tags in codes and box and add content to a web page that you can view in a browser window. Add class attributes to your HTML tags to alter the appearance of those HTML tags. You're going to be able to apply your understanding of the box model, which we'll go over later, to adjust the spacing between content of your web page. So moving things over, centering them, things of that nature. We're going to align content with your web page. So like I just said about centering or like keeping it to the left, keeping it to the right, how we move things around on our web page. Um, adjusting the font size of elements to your web page. So being able to change what size font you're using, like smaller or bigger, different types of ways we can do that. 
and adjusting the colors of your elements of your web page. So these are just kind of like basic things we're going to go over. Hopefully we have time and we can go over some more fun stuff as well. Cool. So let's talk, let's start. So how are we going to get um, build our code? We're going to use something called code and box. And you might be saying to yourself like, what is code and box? Well, code and box is an online platform that allows you to practice writing code that runs in the browser. The main languages of this web are going to be, the main languages of the web <laughs> are going to be HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Codebox allows you to write code in these languages and view the results live on the web. This means that you can create something in the browser and share it with others by sending a link to your website. What's really cool about Codebox is you don't have to sign up for um, anything inside of here. So if you don't want to sign up for something, that's totally fine. You can still follow along and not have to sign up. Um, it's going to let you work on something regardless. Um, the only thing is, is if you want to like save it and you want to like work on it later or make your own environments in here, you're going to probably want to make an account. Um, there's a couple ways you could do that. You could just do um, their sign in process or they also allow third party authentication. So you could sign in with something like Google, which is what I do. Cool. Um, before we get any farther, I want to talk a little bit about bugs in code, because I feel like this is something that frustrates a lot of students at first when they're working on things. So when you code things, things will go wrong and bugs will happen. When we start working on code, we actually start off in a state of brokenness with our code. It's totally normal to have broken code and our jobs as we're um, students or software engineering students is going to be figuring out how it's broken and how to find a solution for this. The process when we first begin coding is that we look at the problem we are having. So you kind of narrow down like, okay, this is the issue I'm happening. Once we kind of narrow down like what our issue is, we wanna come up with an explanation to why that problem is happening. So you kind of are like making guesses. You're like, I see this is my problem. Why is this problem happening? The next thing we're gonna do is we come up with a hypothesis of how we can solve this problem that is happening. Once we come up with a potential solution, we implement the change in our code. We then need to test this out in our code to see if it's worked. Once we test it out, we're gonna see if it does work. Awesome, guess what? You solved your bug, congratulations. More than likely, the first time you try something, it's not gonna be the correct solution. That's okay. We just go through the process again till we find that one that works. This may sound a little familiar to you. Um, most of you, when you take science class, there was a scientific method like around fifth grade that you learned. This is something very similar to how we are doing this. Um, to sum up bugs in general, very normal and very much expected. So if you're running into things, don't get flustered. Just try and go through that debugging process and figure out what's happening. Take those steps because it's gonna happen. There's, I've never met anybody in the entire world that's done something and didn't have a bug. Even the most expert coder in the world runs into problems, runs into bugs, like it happens. And our job is to like take a breath, figure out what that problem is and come up with a good solution. Cool. So before we get into like the actual coding part, which is coming up very soon, um, I wanna just go over a little bit about HTML and CSS to get some of those basics down. <coughs> oh, so sorry, everybody. So the first thing let's talk about is HTML in general. So HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It is the most basic building blocks of the web. It defines the meaning and structure of web content. When we talk about HTML in terms of web pages, it is like the skeleton or the structure of the page. There are three aspects to making a web page and HTML is like the base of it. A really fun fact about HTML is no matter what language you're working in with HTML, it's gonna, it's, no matter what language you're working in when building a website, you're always gonna have an HTML and that will always be the base of it. Um, like I said before, if we're looking at this drawing here, HTML is gonna be like the skeleton or like the structure. It's gonna be, um, it's like I said, it's in every single type of website. The next part we'll talk about a little bit is JavaScript. JavaScript is like your functionality. It's what happens when I do something. Like if I click on this button and it changes the background color, it's the, the behavior of the website. It's making things happen. 
and we're talking in terms of like a human example, it's if I'm walking down the street and I bump my knee and I scream, ouch, it's like I bump my knee and then I have a reaction where I say, ouch, that would be like my reaction. Like it has something's happening once I do something. Um, the CSS is like the decorating part. So it's like the pretty colors, um, how content is positioned, like what it looks like. So in our example of a human, it would be kind of like the skin or like this person's hair is brown, their eye color is brown, their arm length, height, all those things are like things that you control how something looks. That would be CSS. When we talk about the way web, um, web pages are architected, these are the three things that come together to make that website happen. So on this page, I also have in here an HTML tag. So let's talk about like what an HTML tag is and like what these different pieces are. So here we are looking at an HTML tag. An HTML tag is a container for content that we want to include on our website. There are quite a number of different types of HTML tags that we can include to display content in different formats. This is an image from MDM describing the anatomy of an HTML tag. And you might be saying to yourself, well, like, what's MDM? I've never heard of that before. Well, MDM stands for Mozilla Development Network. And MDM is an amazing resource for looking up anything that has to do with HTML or CSS. It's going to be your like number one go to if you have a question about anything or how to do anything with HTML or CSS, that would always be the first place that I would go. I just when, dropped it. Uh, sorry, oh, Candace. I just dropped good? the link for MDN in the chat. So you guys Excellent. Can have it. Cool. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much. No worries. <laughs> so the main parts of our elements are as follows. So you could see I have an opening tag, closing tag, content, and element as a whole. The first part is the opening tag. This consists of the name of the element, which in our case here is going to be this P right here, which represents paragraph when we're talking about HTML um, elements. So this is a P, it stands for paragraph. And so this is going to change based off of what type of um, element we have. In this case, I want to make some sort of paragraph. So I have this P. You could see it's wrapped in an opening and closing angle bracket. And this is going to be where we're starting our element. This is the beginning of where the element is going to take effect. The next part I want to talk to you about is the closing, um, the closing tag. So the closing tag is just like the opening tag, but we add a forward slash in there. So like I said, it's the exact same thing, but this states where that element ends. Very important if it's a type of element that needs a closing tag that you have it because you will start getting all sorts of weird errors if you don't include this closing tag, because it's gonna start wrapping other things inside of it, thinking that it belongs there. So it's really important we have our opening tag and our closing tag if they require both. Nine out of 10 times, elements have an opening and closing tag, but there are instances where we have something that has a self-closing tag, which we will go over a little bit later because things like images have a self-closing tag where they only have one tag versus two tags. The third part of an element is gonna be the content. So this is the content of the element, which in this case, we just have text, but you could have things like text, you could have numbers. There's a bunch of other things that you could put other elements inside of elements. Um, but what the content is, is always gonna be whatever between the opening and the closing um, tags. And then the whole thing as a whole, is going to be called the element, which is going to be the opening tag, the closing tag, and the content combined together. Cool. All right. So that's great and all. So we have like some content on the page, but what if you want to add some style? You want to change something about it. You want to change the color. You want to do something to it. Well, some HTML elements have important attributes that we can set on them to customize how they behave. The syntax for that looks as follows. So if we look here, this is the syntax for this, where it says attribute here. So in this example, the attribute is a class, which we could see here. There's different types of attributes you could do with CSS. We have classes, we have IDs, and you can also grab things from the element itself, like the P right here. Um, in this case, we have a class, and the value that this class is, it says is editor's note. 
The class attribute is commonly used in HTML tags to indicate that we want to apply styling to the element and any others that have the class applied. When we are naming our classes, you can call them whatever you want. So if I wanted to change this from editor notes to like grumpy cat, that's fine. If I want to change my own name, you could change these. It doesn't matter what you're calling these classes. You could literally call them whatever you want. But when we are naming our classes, it is really important to remember to kind of keep them to um, make sense. So in this case, it looks like they called this editor's note. So I'm guessing that this is some sort of editor's note. And that's why they gave it this class of editor's note. Notice that it isn't called something like grumpy cat or cat um, for the class, because what if in what if later we want to change what this editor's note is like, oh, it's not the cat's not grumpy anymore. It's happy. I have to go change it. So now it's a happy cat. If I'm changing this, then I'd also have to change my class every time. So it's kind of better to be a little bit more broad about when you're doing your classes or your attribute selectors when you're naming these, because it's going to be um, what if your text changed? What if something inside there changes? But it'll always be an editor's note but the content might change. So that's why calling it something like an editor's note helps it kind of um, be more relevant and you're not constantly having to change the class name and then change it. There's a bunch of other places you'd have to change it. Um, cool things about classes is that you can give more than one class to a element. So in here, we just have editor's note, but let's say that I also wanted to give it another class called um, teacher's note too. I don't know why teacher, but whatever. <laughs> All I would have to do is just add a space right after this note and then write the next class name. And then let's say I want to give it another class, then I would just add another space and give it that class name. So you can give something as many class names as you want. Um, and what's also really cool about class names is they're reusable. So let's say I have another paragraph underneath here. And I'm like, okay, this uh, next paragraph, I also want it to have the exact same CSS properties that this one has. I can just accomplish that by just giving it the exact same class name, then both paragraphs would be kind of grouped together and follow the CSS for editor's note that I established here. <coughs> cool. So let's talk a little bit about how to read a CSS file. So there are three different CSS vocabulary words we're going to look at today. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is going to be a CSS selector, which right here is going to either be this H1 or this P tag. These are used to describe which elements on the page should be targeted for styling. The two CSS selectors above, this H1 and P, are examples of element selectors. There are many other types of CSS selectors as well, but the most common one you'll use at the beginning of when you're learning to code is probably going to be a class selector. So if we go back one really quick, so if I right here, I'm doing an element selector, it's based off of this right here. But what I'm talking about is class selectors are like the most popular one that we usually use, which would be based off of this, the way you would select it. So an element selector is based off of whatever kind of element it is. Class selector would be based off of what we're calling this class selector. So in this example here, these are both element selectors because I'm basing it off of what the element is called. The second thing we're going to talk about is going to be the CSS property. A CSS property is the name of the style attribute that we're going to apply a value to within a CSS declaration. So an example is like here we have color or font size. Each property has a set of allowable values that you can be explored by reading documentation MDM. So if you look at different elements or different ways to do things, you can look at the, the list is crazy endless, like the things that you could do with CSS. You could change color, font size. You can um, talk about where it's positioned. You could do things like if I hover over this, it changes color. There's like the list of CSS things that you can do to these elements is literally endless. But what's great is MDN has like a list of it and you can explore and see all these different things that you could do. The last thing, is going to be a CSS declaration. <coughs> so a CSS declaration, this is the key and the value put together. So each key value pair indicates a CSS property and the value we want to apply for it. Example here is like color would be the key here. And then the value that we want to set is going to be the color that we have here. So we pick black. So the key is going to be what we're doing. And then this is exactly like what we're setting here. 
So um, that's that. I think we're good to start doing some coding if you guys are ready. <laughs> awesome. I'll drop uh, the code sandbox again, uh, link yes. in the chat. Cool. All right. And then also uh, make sure for your knowledge, I'll also put the MDM uh, Mozilla in here again so that you can Google any terms. Back to yes. You. Yeah. Go crazy. Look at it. Look it up. There's a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> awesome. so yeah I was like so inside of here um we're basically if you look at here this is what's really cool about um code and sandbox is you have your code on this side and then it's going to show you what it would look like in a browser right here and also if we click here it'll open it up like it's an actual browser as well so we kind of get like a more of a feeling of like what this web page looks like so inside of here, you can notice there's a lot of code written here, but the only thing I'm seeing on here, it says happy Halloween. So what's happening inside of here is it's only saying happy Halloween, but it's here because everything that's inside of this head of this document all won't show up on your browser. What will show up outside of here is we have something called the title. And what the title does, if you look in the browser here, do you see how, how it appears up here? So the title is gonna be what appears in the tab when we're on the web page. So if I want to change something about this, so like let's say I change this to Candace's sample, and I need to save it. So you also have to be saving stuff as you go inside of here. And the way that we save stuff inside of here is going to be, um, if you're on a Mac, you're gonna do Command S, oops. And then if you're on a PC, it's Control S. So they're both just a little different depending on what you're, um, what, if you're on a PC versus if you're on a Mac. But then if I go here and I refresh this page, do you see how that's now changed to Candace's example? Cool. So the title elements. There, mm -hmm. Sorry, there's a quick question. Um, yeah. Could you explain the formatting in the index.html? How do I know how many spaces to indent? So when we're talking about indenting, um, if I didn't have any indenting here, like it wouldn't make a difference. It would still work the same. But when we're talking about like industry standard, Every time I have something that's inside of something, because these are kind of like containers, I always indent it one. So inside of here, I have my HTML and inside my HTML lives this, the head right here and the body. And if we look, I could see that this head, which is, should be here, is this, hold on, tab, tab, oops. Backspace. So these should line up, these should, cool. So I can see that the head is lining up with the body because what these are called, when we're talking about code, I always talk about it in like family terms. So these, um, so the HTML would be like the parent element. And then this head and this body are like sibling elements. So when the, I'd say sibling elements, it means that they're next to each other. So they belong to this HTML inside and then indented one is gonna be the head and the body, but we could see that they're at the same level because they're both at like the same level inside of our code too. They're not nested inside of each other. They're both just next to each other. Then from there, we have our title and our meta tag here. And these are indented one because these are both children of this head document, which is a child of our HTML. Same thing with this H1. This H1 is a child of this body tag, which is a child of our HTML. Does that answer the question? I think so. Cool. So that's when we're talking about indenting. So inside of here, like I said, we have the head and then we have our body of our document. Um, the head of our document is going to be um, where we're doing stuff like connecting external links, um, where we are declaring specific things like in here, I'm like declaring char set UTF-8, um, eight, which is just kind of telling um, my website like what specific um, character set that I'm using. So in this one, I'm guessing it's just saying like English and like whatever um, UTF-F represents. And then the title is going to be what appears in this tag here. 
And the body is going to be like what actually like appears on the page, which is cool. So right now, like I said, we just have an H1, but I think we should add an image in here. So when we go to add an image, if you're not sure to how to add an image, I'm going to kind of show you how to use MDMs inside of here. So if I go into Google and I'm looking for an image, I might do something like image um, HTML MDN and hit enter. And I can see I have some stuff that's popped up. I'm going to click on this one right here. And if I scroll down, I can see this is my MDN web docs images in HTML. And when I scroll down, I could see that it's starting to give me examples of what it looks like to put an image inside of my code. Documentation and looking up documentation is a huge part of coding and is super important. So it's really important to get comfortable with reading this documentation and looking through this documentation and just comfortable Googling. Like there's a million memes out there, like what people think I do, which is like rocket science, which what I actually do is like just Googling. 90, 90 times it's like, it's just gonna be really important to like read documentation, getting used to look up this stuff. So let's take this example here and let's see if it works. So we're just gonna grab this image <coughs> and we're gonna go to my example and I'm just gonna paste it in. Cool. And I'm gonna save it. So I'm gonna do my command S cause I'm on a Mac. And I could see I have this broken image link here. What this broken image link means is that there's something wrong with the way that I'm declaring this right here, or it doesn't exist. My guess is just because this is just some sort of like <coughs> example of how to use this. It's not something that actually exists. So I'm going to want to actually look up some sort of images that I could put on this page. So let's look up free images. And if we look up here, there's a ton of really good sources. Um, my favorite, as you can see, I've gone to it before, is Unsplashed. Another really, really good one is going to be um, Morgue File is also like a great one as well. Since it's like Halloween time, let's look up something that has to do with Halloween. I wish we could use these. These are the paid ones. And then these are the free ones down here. We could just use this one here. So you're just going to pick a picture. Once you pick it, I just double click on it or right click on it. I'm going to copy the image address. And then I'm going to go back to my code in here. And in between these quotes, I'm going to delete this here. But I could see that it had SRC then has quotes. I'm going to add my image um, page I just got here. So I'm going to paste it here. And I'm going to save my page. And I can see that now it's on here. As you can see, very big, very huge, but we got some stuff working. And if I go here, I could check it out <laughs> and I can see that it's on here. So we have an H1, which is great, um, an H1 element. And now I have an image with um, that's grabbing an image from myself. But I want to be able to like do something with this, right? Like I like this is just kind of really basic. I want to make some changes. I want to like change some colors. I want to do some cool stuff. So in the head of my document, I'm going to add some CSS inside of here. So there's a couple different ways you can add CSS. You can do it inline, which means actually inside of our code inside of here. We can do it inside the head of our document, and then we can also do it as an external style sheet. The way I'm going to be showing you guys today is going to be with an external style sheet, which is the most industry standard way of doing it. <coughs> so inside of here, the way we do this is it's going to be something called a link. And with this link, we have to tell it what we want it to link to. So right now, I don't have anything that has a file that has to do with CSS, so I'm going to have to create one. So if I click on here, I can create a new file, and I'm going to call this style that CSS. And I can see that now I've made the style.css folder. There's nothing in it, but it's been created. So I can actually like link my HTML to this page now. So I write an href. And what I do in the quotes here, I'm going to put what I want my HTML page to be connected to. So it's going to give us a bunch of hints, which is great. So I know it's the style that I want to connect to. So I click style.css. The next thing that I'm going to want to do in here is I have to tell it what kind um, of link that I'm making here. <coughs> so the type of link that I'm making here, it's to a style sheet. 
Can can I pause? Yeah, please. For a second. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone wants to know what does the line um, uh, meta char set equal UTF eight do? So it's you're just declaring what kind of character set you're using. So when character means what kind of like um, are you using like English? Are you using like these specific numbers? And like the universal one is UTF eight. So that's the one like ninety nine percent of the time you're using unless you're doing something like really crazy. But it's just kind of like letting your documentation know like what kind of character set you're using. Awesome. And then. Andrew wants to know, does the breaks, uh, do the breaks between the uh, slash head and body affect the code? Just wondering. Yeah, they, they don't affect the code at all. It's just kind of like good standard for like how we're writing it out, like industry standards. So your code looks like neat and clean. And kind of when somebody else is looking over it, it kind of makes sense. Um, just like the indents, you can get rid of these indents. You could put them all like lined up together and it would still work but it's just a good way to break up the code for yourself or for other people looking at your code. And then uh, Kevin is having trouble adding the photo, but Kevin, uh, could you elaborate? Um, does it look like the image uh, source equals and the image that- um, Here, why don't we go in? here? Why don't we go back to that image really quick? Let me move us right here. So if we go back to MDN HTML image, and we go into this, remember, go to the MDM documentation here. And when we're doing images, you just, it's all a self. Remember how I told you before how we'd have like self-closing element tags? Image is one of them where we're not having another tag, a closing tag. It just has the opening tag and everything happens in this opening tag. So inside of it, it just has the image. Then you do SRC, which stands for like the source, like where am I grabbing this image from? And then in quotes, you're going to have where that where you're grabbing the image from. In our case, we're grabbing it from a URL. So when I went here, I right clicked on the picture and I copied the image address. And that's how I got that URL, which resulted in this right here. Any other questions? Uh, the, uh, no, I think that's pretty much it. Um, some people are trying to help troubleshoot from the chat. So thank you. We love to have a community. Um, Kevin wants to know, how can he share his, his personal sandbox so that others in, in the chat can potentially cool. help? So there's this share button. So when you click share, it's going to give you a link and let you send it to people. Got it. And then Jonathan has a quick question, and I think this is a good one. I've, I've heard this yeah. at other events. Um, would you normally get the image from a URL or can you get it from your hard drive? You can get it from your hard drive. So it's um, where we're using it now with this um, specific thing, because this is like a web application. So it's just easiest to show you with the URL. But when you're working on like your local environment, you're working um, coding actual websites. Um, not, mostly you're going to probably be using images from your actual website. So if we look back at this one here, that's where something like this would be. Do you see how this like isn't a URL? It's probably because somewhere in there um, on the same code, they have something called dinosaur.jpg. And this is like inside their code or inside their computer that they're grabbing from. Or like they might have some sort of images folder and then they're grabbing this particular image out of that images folder. That's what this um, little forward slash is. So it's like, this is, they have a folder called images and then they're grabbing this dinosaur.jpg from that images folder. So like, this is like using a URL like we're doing today, but yes, you 1000% can grab it, like add an images folder and like grab it specifically like from the web page you're creating or you could have it on your computer and like grab it from wherever it's living inside your computer. Awesome, I think uh, we're good. And Kevin figured it out. Awesome, Kevin. Yay, great job. <laughs> um, and Samantha said, what does SRC mean? And, and that means sure. source. Source, mm -hmm. So it's like the source, like where you're grabbing that image from. So it's kind of like you're giving it a pathway. So it's like, where am I gonna grab this image from? So this is just like a website. So it's going to this website and it's grabbing that specific image. Any other questions? These are all really good questions. Yeah. Um, uh, which button did you click to create a new HTML file? Quick, quick question. So the HTML file was already on here, but do you mean the CSS file? Uh, yeah, I think that cool. might be So it. all it is right here under files, it says new file, and I just clicked it right up here. So if I click right here, I'll just do like blah.html, and it's going to create a new HTML file for me. And then to delete anything, you just click this little X here and it'll delete it. Perfect. Thank you. I think we can keep going. Cool. Excellent. I love questions. So yeah, like anytime. 
So inside here, we have this, and then we're saying like what kind of thing it is, which is going to be a style sheet. And then I just need to tell it like what kind of file this is. So the type is going to be text. And specifically, it's a CSS text file. And this is also going to be a self closing tag. So I just don't have, I don't have a closing tag. It's a self closing tag for this one as well. And make sure as you all are going that you're saving. So you're either doing um, control S for PCs and um, command S for Macs. Cool. So now I have this connected. Now that it's connected, I could start writing some CSS directly inside of here. So if I go to my style sheet, the way that we're going to do this, if you look back at this here, and I'm going to go back a couple, where did my thing go for this? Oh, here it is. Cool. So if I go back here, if we look at this here, this is how we're going to be writing out our CSS files. So we're going to be, um, at first, we're just going to be using the element name. So in our case, we have an H1, and then we're going to do some curly brackets. And inside here, we're going to be doing some key and value pairs to represent like what we're going to be working on and what we want to change about our elements. So if we go back to our code here, um, the one we're grabbing from is going to be an H1. And if you're wondering where I'm getting this H1 from, if I look in my index.html, I could see inside of here that this is an H1 tag. So I'm going back here and I have my curly brackets and let's talk about like some of the things that I'm going to want to change in here. <coughs> so to, um, I'm going to write myself some notes about what I want to change inside of here. So the way that you can write notes is you could write them out first. <coughs> Ooh. So I can write out what I want to do and the things we're going to do is we're going to change the color. I'm going to want to add an underline. I want to make it bigger make the font bigger. And I want to add some space and maybe align it to the center later. So as you can see now, when I'm writing these notes out to myself, it's breaking my code. And I don't want it breaking my code. I want to be able to just have them be like, be able to look at my notes and work on my code as I go. Very common when you're coding. So the way that we could handle this is on a Mac, it's going to be command forward slash. And you can see that now it looks like it turned this gray color and then has this like star and forward slash in front and the end here. Um, if you're on a PC, it would be control forward slash would do the same thing. And for some reason, if it's not working for you, you can always just do the forward slash star and then the star um, backslash um, forward slash over here too. And it would do the same thing. So now that I have my notes ready to go for what I wanna do, let's do some stuff. So I know that color is gonna be just the key of color. And this also, when you're writing these out, is going to give you a list of things as it goes. And since we're talking about Halloween, I want to change the color of this one, each one to orange. So I could see now that it's changed this color to orange, which is awesome, and that it's working and all my things are connected correctly. I'm going to save this. And notice when I save it, it adds this little semicolon here. As we're writing these things in this H1 as we go down, it's really important to remember to add the semicolon at the end. If we don't add the semicolon at the end, what ends up happening is that it's gonna break your code because it's not going to be like the end of the declaration. And we need an end to our CSS declaration. So it's really important to end this here. Um, we're gonna add a background color so I could show you what I mean what happens. So if I do background, oop, not background, I'll do background dash color. And I'm gonna do background color of black. And then let's say I take this off here. You see how it breaks my code? It's gonna tell me I'm missing a semicolon. Your code when you're working on your own, not in this program might not be as generous and let you know that you're getting a CSS, um, that it's, you're missing a semicolon, it might just break. So it's just really important to remember that anytime you're writing a CSS declaration, as soon as you're done writing it, you have that semicolon. Cool. There, there's a few questions. Yeah, let's do um, it. Someone asked, uh, Sherry asked, will you post code for um, arrow link href line? I think that might be on the index.html. On um, post Sorry. code for which one? This one? Yes. So what do you mean post code? Like post all this code later? Um, or I guess in the chat. Uh, yeah, I can post this in the right. chat for you. Yeah, of course. And then, um, and I guess 
there's another question like what is on what's on that line what like that's I think that people got a little lost when we moved to sure. the style sheet so um I guess like if we could just un- go over line six and of course again yeah. and then figure out yeah so in here the first thing we have is this href which means that it's referencing like where we're getting this to because we're making a link here so we're making a connection between our html page and some other file that we have inside of our code so i'm trying to connect this file to this file so the first thing i have to do is i have to tell what file i want to connect i'm telling it the name of the file so if i look here i see the name of the file style css so that's what I'm putting inside of here. I'm connecting it to the style CSS. The second part is I have to tell it what kind of file that I'm connecting. So the type of file that I'm connecting is a style sheet, which is what a CSS file is. Um, CSS file is called, it's a style sheet because it's styling. It's like the one that's like changing things, it's styling it. It's called a style sheet. <clears throat> and the last is like, what kind of file is it? Like, is it a text file? Is it, there's like different types of files out there. Um, the type that this is, is it a text file? And specifically, it's a text CSS file, which we could see here, I have .css. So it's just telling it like, hey, this is a CSS file. Any other oh, questions about that? Awesome, I think that explains all of that. And then um, <laughs> Dion says, can I see how you change the uh, font again? Uh, I guess like from uh, the color. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So inside of here, um, all I do is we have these key and value pairs. So inside of here, if I go back to the code here, you could see that I have to have my like selector that I'm doing. In this case, I'm doing an element selector, just like I'm doing in this example. And then I'm telling it the key, which is kind of like what I want to change. And then I'm telling it the value of like what I'm changing it to. So in this example here, I have the key of color and then the value that I'm changing it to is orange. So like I could change this, let's say red and I'll change it to red or like aqua and I'll change it to aqua. And then this part is it's just very similar to the color. This is just a different type of key that I'm changing. So in this one, I'm changing the background color of this element. So it's talking about this element here and I'm changing this background color to black. So that H1 now's background color is that black color. And I could change this too, like if I said, let's say fuchsia. That's really ugly, but <laughs> it changes it to fuchsia. <laughs> Any questions about that? No, I think that's uh, pretty <coughs> helpful. And then one last question from Sherry is, yeah. what's the package.json file? Sure. For? So this doesn't have anything to do with what we're doing. And it could, <laughs> I could delete it and it would just go away. But just because the way this program works, it's just there. Um, but this is going to have to do more with JavaScript. And what package.json is, is there are specific packages you could have with JavaScript and um, things that like help your JavaScript along. And that just stores them for you, basically. But we're not using JavaScript, so it's just kind of there. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Great. So in here. Oh, we're... sorry. Oh. One other question. Yeah, of I course. think this is helpful. Can, oh, like, or I'm going to rephrase the question because Marzi says, can we write both CSS and HTML code on the same page? You but can. You can. But this you is can, a way. But this that... is the industry standard way of doing it. So like, let's say I'll show you guys want me. I'll show you really quick. So if I grab this and we go to our index.html. And I'm just going to take this and comment it out really quick. So you can comment out code too if you don't want it running right that second. And remember to comment code out just like I did in here with these notes. It's going to be um, command forward slash for Mac and control forward slash for PCs. So I'm just commenting it out really quickly just so I can show you how this would work. So if I wanted to put them on the same page, I would just create inside of my head the style and then I can put all of my CSS inside of here and it does the exact same thing as you can see over here. <laughs> but like you said, industry bad, standard though. is yes. to do. It's not industry standard. It's not a good practice to do it this way, but I just wanted to show you in case you wanted to know. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Sound good? Yeah. I'm going to delete this. 
so nobody gets confused. <laughs> cool. Perfect. <laughs> Great. And awesome. then, guys, keep coming with the questions, but I want to let Candace get through a little bit more of the lesson. So I will get around to some of your questions shortly. Yeah, sorry. I was like, we're going to feel like we're not going to get through anything because I keep answering questions. I feel bad. Cool. Awesome. So in there, so now we have this color, we have this background color. What if I want to add like something else? Like I, we talked about an underline. I want to add an underline here. Let's go to our um, MDN again. So I'm going to do MDN and I'm going to do underline. Look at this one here. And this is going to give me like a bunch of really cool examples of how different CSS I can do with underline and exactly the code I want to use, which is great. So inside here, I can see it's a key of text decoration. And then this one looks like it has more than one argument in here. So it has green wavy underline. So the first one's going to be the color. The second one's the type of underline it is. And the third one is just declaring that it's um, underline. So let's grab this one here. Oops. Perfect. So I'm going to copy this here. And you can copy when you see these things, this little clipboard here, when you click it, that's just copying it. And if I go here, I'm going to add this to my code here. And I can see now I have a green wavy underline here. <coughs> the last thing I'm going to talk about before we go to box models is font size. Like, how do I make this bigger? How do I change the size of this? So if I want to change the size of this, it's something called text. No, sorry, font size. And then I can pick what kind of font size I want. When we're talking about font size, there's a couple different ways you can do font size. One way you could do it is with something called pixels. And pixels are kind of like whatever you put, it's going to be that size and it's not going to change. And it's going to be that size no matter how big I make my page, no matter how small I make my page, no matter what I'm opening this on, it's always going to be that size, which isn't great to use, especially when you're um, wanting something that's like a responsive website. So there's some other ones that are better choices. Um, you can do percentages too. Um, but the best one is probably going to be something called EMs. What EMs are, is kind of like a scalable unit that's based off the default size of the browser. So if I were to do something like one EM, one EM represents about 16 um, pixels inside of your code. And if you're wondering like what a pixel is, a pixel, your web page is based off of like pixels. They're like little boxes that are going through. And so this is the size of like 16 of them together, which is kind of like what text looks like. Basic default text is usually 1 EM, which is 16 pixels. But what if I want to make this bigger? Because this is really small just doing it as 1 EM, right? This is really tiny. So I can go in the browser. If I go back to my browser here, did I save this? Nope. Got to make Make sure you're saving it. And you could tell the reason I could tell it wasn't saved is before if I like add something here, like let's change this to just two really quick. Do you see how this little um, button is a circle right now? And when I hit save, it turns back to the X. So when you see that little circle, it means your stuff isn't saved at the moment and you need to save it. So just pay attention to, you wanna make sure there's no little bubbles on there because that means you haven't saved anything. So if I look here, there's another way for us to look at our code straight from the browser is if you hit command shift and C together, it's gonna bring something up that's called your index um, tools. And I think in Mac, on PC, it'd be control um, shift C. If you're having problems with it, another way you could do it is you could go view developer and then go to the inspect elements. And that's the same thing as well, is getting to this page here. <coughs> so inside here, it's gonna show us our HTML that we currently have. And you can see that this is changing colors currently because I can pick and click things and see what different values are on here. So if I click on this little arrow with this square and then I click on this happy Halloween, I could see the CSS that I have on here right in front of my face, which is great. And it lets me manipulate things very similar to how we're doing it here, but you're not always gonna work in this codes and box. You're gonna be working on it on your own. So this is like how you would do kind of the same thing if you're working on it like on your own. So inside of here, I can see that it has a color, background color, text decoration, and font size. So I can change the font size here. So EMs are based off of that like default fault value. So one EM is going to be around 16 pixels. If I want to double that size, it would be two EMs, which turns it to 32 pixels. 
and then triple that size would be three AMs, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, like making it um, bigger, and bigger. You could do um, decimals with EMs, so I could do something like two point five. It lets you do decimals, but for right now, we're just going to make it bigger. I want to make it three EM inside of here. This is not going to be a permanent change, so that's why this is also great to play around in here because this isn't going to permanently change your code at all. It's just going to be like playing around, making sure that it works. If you're like, okay, great, like 3 a.m., 3 a.m.s, that's exactly what I want. That looks great. Then I could take what I've got there and I can add it to my CSS. Because if I just refresh this here, I can see it goes back to the normal thing. Because no changes that you make in your inspect tools are permanent changes. They're just kind of like a sandbox for you to like play around with, get kind of the CSS looking the way you want. And then you could take that information back here and make your permanent changes in your actual CSS file. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about font size, decorating, we wanna kind of start talking about how to position this stuff. So I'm gonna go back to the slides and we're gonna talk a little bit about box models. Cool, let's go back here. All right, cool. Let's talk a little bit about box models. So in HTML, everything is a box. Um, everything is just like a container inside of a container, basically. <coughs> so like I said, everything in HTML is boxes, and these boxes contain different elements. So if we're looking at this example here, you can see I have this giant box of HTML. We kind of talked about this a little bit when you guys are asking me questions. And then inside this box, I have a box that contains the head with information, and then I have a box that contains this body. And then inside those boxes, I have three meta tags in here and I have a title, which all represent like little mini boxes too. So when I'm thinking about box model, I'm talking about like the container aspect, like HTML, it's all a bunch of boxes. And sometimes we put those boxes inside of other boxes is what we're talking about when we're talking about um, HTML box model. So you might be like, well, how do I manipulate these boxes? How do I move them around? Like, how can I make them bigger or smaller? Like, what can I do with these boxes? So there are a couple different ways we can manipulate these boxes. Um, the first way, which is gonna be the orange wrapped around here is the margin, um, which is represented by the orange. It's um, on the outside of our box. So when we have our content, you can push things away on the outside of it. So it doesn't affect the size of the actual box itself, but it's gonna be pushing it around in the space that you have it currently in or in its parent elements. Another way that you could do that is with padding represented by the green. And what padding does is it makes the box bigger. So it adds space, but from the inside. So it's gonna make that box actually larger, which is cool. So you could do margin, which isn't gonna affect the size of the box and just add space on the outside. Or you could do padding, which does affect the size of the box and makes that box actually bigger. The last way, which isn't used quite as often is gonna be with borders. Borders aren't really used to space out objects, but they do take into account because based off the size of your border, it's gonna make that box a little bit larger and space it out a little bit farther because it makes that box a little bit larger. So let's take some of this information and let's actually like move some stuff around and see what we could do with some of this code. So inside of here, we have this um, Halloween in this H1 right now. And right now it's really pressed like right against the wall here. If we look at our example here, it's like right pressed against the wall. And I wanna move it over a little bit. I wanna move it over a little bit outside the wall. So one way I could do that is with margin. Like we just talked about, margin is gonna move things on the outside. So it's not gonna change the size of my H1 as a whole. <coughs> so the first thing I need to do is I can't just put margin on it the way it currently is. Because if I go to my example here and I look at this inside of here, I can see that this is going 100% width of my website. You could see that it starts at the beginning and goes all the way to the end, which means that it's going to be hard to add any margin or space because it's already going like 100% width of everything. So I need to change the width of what this H1 is, which we could see represented by the black inside of it. And I'm gonna make it smaller so that I can actually have room to move it around. Because if it's at 100% width, like it currently is, it doesn't have any room right now. When something has 100% width like this, it's called something called a block element. 
What block means is that it goes at 100% width of the page. Most elements inside of HTML are block level elements, except for a couple like pictures or images or something called inline block, which means it's just going to be the size of the actual content and not go the entire width of the page. So I could see that if I go over this image, you could see that it doesn't go 100% width of the page. It's just the size of the actual image. Where if I look at this happy Halloween, I see that it goes all the way to the very end of the page. And that's what block level elements do. You can change what happens with block level elements by giving it a different width. So if we go to our code here, I can change the width of this and we'll change the width to something like 40%. Cool, and you could see how much smaller it got, right? That's probably too small. Let's try 50%. Mm. I'll say 70%. That's fine, we'll leave it the way it is. So we could see that it's made it a little smaller. It's even taken our text and it's kind of like wrapped it down because we made this container so small with the size of it. If I look at it here, I could see that it's, we'll make it a little smaller. We'll tell you like 60%. Cool, I'm gonna save it. I look at here, cool. So I could see it's there, but I could see it's still like on the um, edge of my document, but I could see now it's not going 100% width of the page, right? I have this space here that's not being taken up. So I can actually add some margin to it now. So if I add margin, and I'm going to add margin to the left, you could specify where you're adding your margin. And I'm going to say something like um, 8%. And do you see how it jumped and now it's moved over 8%. And if I look over here, I can see that it's jumped and it started to move over. And it's getting pushed by this margin, but it's not affecting the size of this H1 as a whole. But if I were to change this margin to padding, which remember when we just talked about padding is on the inside of the H1, like it deals with space, but from the inside, I could see that it still has that space. It's still pushed over, but I'm doing it from the inside. So I could see that the element has grown with that space. Whereas if I do it with margin, it's going to push away and it's not growing from inside of that H1. So the H1 staying the same size at 60%. But if I did it with padding, it's still pushing the text over, but it's adding that space um, within that H1 at that. Does that make sense? <laughs> so we have this, we're pushing it over. What if I want to center it though? So right now I have a width of 60% and I know this is a block level element. So the way that I can center this code is I could do something um, with margin and you can add something called auto and I wanna do it on the left side And then I'm going to add it on the right side. And what that does is it's going to take your element and automatically fill in the space all the way on the left and automatically fill in the space all on the right. So it's going to center your image, your um, whatever element you have inside of here. So if I look up here, I can see that now that this is directly in the center because it's automatically taking that space on the left and automatically taking that spot on the right and it's centered it in the center here. Another way that we could do this too is if you want it to be um, directly in the middle is we could do something called text align center. So if I don't wanna mess with the width and I'm like, well, I still want like that to be like the way it was before, but I want it to be just that text to be in the center is I could do something called text align and do center. And I can look at my code and I could see that the block level element is still the exact same size that it was before, but now my text in the middle is completely centered. Cool. So after that, let's talk about our image. So we've got our text centered, it's looking great, but now I want this image to be smaller because it's huge. And let's maybe like add something to it, like a border. So if we go into our code here, I'm gonna to wanna to grab that image. And so right now I can see I have this image tag, which would be its element that I could grab from. <coughs> or what I could do is I could add something like a class to it, which I think is a good choice because we've been talking about classes, but haven't used any classes. So you can see how to use a class. So inside of here, I'm gonna add a class 
Remember, this is the attribute that I'm adding and I'm going to assign it. And remember, we could call this whatever we want, whatever makes sense. Um, in my case, I'm just gonna call it Halloween IMG to represent image. And then I'm going to grab whatever I called it here. I'm also gonna save and go to my style here. And I'm going to paste what I called it over there. When you're using um, class selectors and ID selectors, you can't just write it like we did here, like an H1. It needs to know that it's a class. And the way that we tell it that it's a class is we just add a dot in front of it. So anytime in your CSS page, if you're trying to get something that's a class, you just make sure you add a dot in front of it. So I'm going to save this here. And then let's grab this here and then we're going to want to do something with it so now i have this halloween image and which is all great but when we're talking about images we actually have to do um wrap this image in another tag on top of it so we're going to wrap this in something called a div because it's really hard to center images so if we give it a div that we wrap around it it's going to help us to be able to um, center our image better. So I'm going to take, I'm actually going to take this class and move it from my image and put it inside my div. For those of you wondering like, okay, div, what the heck's a div? I don't know what that is. <laughs> a div is basically just like a generic element. So we use something called HTML5. And HTML5 is like the newest version of um, selectors in HTML. And they give us these specific things inside of here, things like um, title or image or H1. But before that, everything was just divs. So you'd give it a div and then you'd give it like a class or an ID to have an identifiers. So if you ever just need like a basic container, like you don't need it to be a specific like H1 or a specific image or anything like that, you would just make a div and then you just are going to give it either a class or an ID as an identifier for that div. So inside of here, we're going to want to make some changes with our code. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is I'm going to want to make some changes on that specific element. So with this element, I'm going to grab it by its element name. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. There's two questions about divs. Sure. Uh, one. Uh, what does div stand for? <laughs> um, it's just like basically like a basic level element. It's just like, I don't and I know. I can look just, it up yeah. in MDN. Yeah. I, <laughs> I can Google that. Um, but also, how do you know when to use a div? So if you're not doing anything specific, so things like H1s and images, they're already going to have some like pre-done CSS on them. That happens like you'd see this like H1 had like a preset text that it was or like images like are automatically inline. Um, which is like instead of being like a block level element. So those are very specific. They're very specific to like what's happening with them. Um, and you might just want like, you know what? I just want like a container. I don't want any any um, previous CSS on it. I just want a blank container where I'm writing all my own CSS and that's when you would use a div. Perfect. And just so everyone knows, I, I Googled what does div stand for, <laughs> literally those words. And it stands for division. So yeah, it was like containers, divisions yeah. between your code. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? Uh, no, I think we're good right now. Cool. So inside of here, I have this container and I'm gonna want this container be to be the thing that's gonna control my image size. So the way I do that is first, I'm gonna have to take this image and I need to make the width 100%. So it's gonna be exactly the size of whatever my container is. So I'm gonna change my width to 100%. Cool. So now do you see how it's changed a little bit already? So it's kind of following whatever size this div is right here. And then I'm going to want to change the height. And I want to change the height to auto, which means I want that height to be whatever this width that now that it's in this container changes to, I want the height to follow suit so that my image doesn't get like skewed or looks weird. So inside of here, this is now my div. And now that this is 100% of this div, I can control everything from this div instead of having to control it from the image, which is a lot harder to do. So inside of here, I can now change the width of this specific image. So I can do something like, we could do like width 
and we'll do like 70%. Cool. And do you see how that width of the image has now changed? Just so you know, if I did put the width of 70% inside of here, it would change the size of the image, but we're going to want to eventually center this image. And this is an automatic block level element, divs are. Most elements are block level, but images are something called inline block. And inline block elements are a lot harder to center than um, block level elements. So by putting this image inside of this div, if I can control it from the block level element, it's gonna be a lot easier for me to control when I'm trying to center it. So I'm gonna save again. And so I have a width of 70%. And then what we're gonna to wanna to do is we're gonna also wanna add a border in here. So for borders, it takes in three things very similar to how this text decoration with the underline takes in. The first thing that it's gonna take in is gonna be how big our border is. So inside here, I'm gonna do 10 pixels. So that's gonna be the size of our border. The next thing is gonna be the color of the border. So in our case, we'll do black. And the last part of it is gonna be what kind of border. So just like um, for the text decoration, there was things like wavy or dotted. There's also things with borders and our border here, we're just gonna make a solid border. Cool. And you could see here that now I have a border around my image but I still wanna center this image. So now that this is a block level element I'm dealing with, I could do something just like text align. Oops, not text line, sorry. We're gonna do what we did before. So we're gonna do margin. Um, before we were doing margin left zero and margin right zero, there's a shortcut way to do this and it's called margin and you do zero then right auto. And what this is telling us is the first part of it is going to be top and bottom. So we're saying we don't want any margin on the top or bottom. And the second parts are the left and right side. So I'm saying that I want automatic space on the left and automatic space on the right. So then if I go up here and I refresh this page, I can see that it's now centered and it's inside of here. Um, the last thing is we have this little white space here, <coughs> which is kind of annoying. So inline elements automatically give us a little white space underneath our content, no matter what, because they're trying to space it with other inline elements. So the way to prevent that is I can change how this is displayed. So I can turn this image from inline to block. And that's going to get rid of that little space, because remember, we have elements that automatically have CSS properties attached. Images automatically have space at the bottom automatically. So we just change the display of it to get rid of that little white space there. Cool. And then I know we have a time crunch, so I was going to show you guys extra stuff, but I think it's a good place to stop. <laughs> so you guys can have watch it. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, let me uh, come back on video here. Um, let me, oh, what did I do with my selfie? There we go. <laughs> So if you guys have any questions, um, let me know uh, in the chat and uh, we'll start answering them. Someone said, um, I'm still having a hard time getting what the difference between inline is versus block. Sure. So the difference is, is block is going to be 100% width of a page. So if we're looking at code here and I put a background color on here on purpose, so you can see how big the div actually goes. And H1 is just, so all things are divs, but H1s and like things like images are just like, they're divs, but they already have like special CSS characters like added to it. So inside of here, it goes 100% width of the page, which is block. Anything that's a block level element goes 100% width of your page. So you just have to kind of like remember that where inline isn't gonna go 100% width of the page. What it does is it's just gonna be the size of whatever's inside of that container. So like, for example, our image, when we look at it, it's only the size of what the image is. It's not gonna be 100% um, width of the page. It's only gonna be whatever's inside of it. That's how big it is. Um, another thing that's in line is like text. Like if you look at text, if we're sent as an H1, it's just gonna be the size of like however big it is. Um, there's something called inline block, which is like a combination of both. Because inline is kind of like a bummer, like it's great because it's going to be like, okay, that's great. It's exactly the size of the content, what I want. 
but you can't use things like margins and padding on things that are inline. So, but inline block is kind of like the best of both worlds. And I use it all the time because you can take it and you, it's the size of the content, but I could add that margin and pad and like play around with it as much as I want. <laughs> awesome. Um, Erica wants to know, where can I use this coding not in sandbox, like an R console or a text editor? Yeah, so I always use VS Code is my favorite. <laughs> so you can literally just open up VS Code and just like start writing code and writing an HTML page and it'll like pop up on the screen. Do we have time that I could like show it really quick? Yeah, sure. It takes like two seconds. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. And, and I, I don't want my hard uh, stop for the for the baseball game to stop, you know, <laughs> answering these questions. These are great questions from the audience. So yeah, let's do so it. Let me um, bring up my VS code really quick. So I've been here. Okay, so I'm gonna do a new, so file, new file. All right, oh, cool. we can't, I don't know. Oh, oh no, I, I know, I'm right. We, yeah, I was like, I don't okay. think you can see it. Yeah, sorry. I'm going to do a new share and I'll share. Okay. Uh, let me share the entire desktop. Desktop two. Cool. Can you guys, hold on. Not let yet. me see new share. Desktop two. Share. Can you guys see my whole desktop now? Yes. Yes, excellent. Cool. So inside of here, all I did was open up a new thing in VS Code. There's nothing in here right now. It says open folders. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys, my dogs. <laughs> so I'm going to open, um, I'm going to make a new file on my desktop here. So I'm just going to right click here. Da, 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 da. Um, I just want to open a new file. We'll make a new folder. Actually, I'll do it from the terminal. So I'm going to go in the terminal here. Let's see my terminal. Cool. So, and I don't know if any of you have worked with terminals now, but every computer has one. Um, if you're on a PC, it's going to be something called Ubuntu. Um, in ours, it's Max is just one terminal that kind of like does it all. Um, with PCs, you kind of have two terminals that are doing everything. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm going to do something called CD. And what CD stands for is like change directories. And I'm going to change my directory to my desktop. And then I'm going to create um, a file inside of here. So I'm going to create something called, I'm going to make actually a folder and I'm going to make a folder MKDIR. So this is called MKDIR, which is make directory. And I'm going to make something called practice. Um, already exists MKDIR practice. Cool. <laughs> and I need to go into this folder. So I'm going to change directories again into my new folder I just created, which is called p underscore practice. And now inside of here, I'm gonna open it with my VS code. And this might be something, if you guys are familiar with VS code, if you're not, no big deal. When you get VS code, there's certain codes that'll automatically open your application for you. So inside of here, I'm going to do um, code dot, which is going to open my file, which we have here now. Cool. And you can see my folder, empty folder here. I'm going to add a new file and I'm going to call it index.html. And inside of here, I now have an index.html file that I can like play around with and do stuff. So um, what's cool about VS Code is if I start typing out HTML, it's going to give me some like starter code and I can just hit HTML5. And you can see it starts printing out some of the stuff that we've been talking about today. The title just says documents. There's nothing in there, but it's kind of like a good like starter point for yourself. And inside of here, I'll just do an H1. And I'm just going to have this say, hello world, which if you get familiar with coding, you're going to see hello world a million times everywhere. <laughs> and so I can click on this and I can pick how I want to open it. So I could do da -da 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 -da, reveal in finder. So it's going to show me exactly in my code where it is. And then I right click on this and I open with Google Chrome. And there it is. Hello world. <laughs> So you don't just have to do it on here. You can um, download any of these specific um, coding applications and get started just making web pages and building things out. You can add your CSS just like you did before, but now it's saved on your like local computer. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, Andrew, uh, and this might take us back to the beginning a little bit, but Andrew is um, having a hard time connecting the CSS on the other file to the HTML. Andrew says, I created another document with .css, but it didn't change the image or anything um, through the HTML 
uh, though the HTML changed when I changed things. <laughs> I messed up. Um, no, it's okay. <laughs> so um, did you um, did you name your CSS, was it called style? It doesn't matter what it's called, but did you call it like style CSS? Let me look at the chat. I think uh, Andrew said he just named it dot CSS. So Andrew, why it don't you- It needs to have a name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you it has to give to be it a called, name. Like, yeah, you have to give it a name. So it has to have something like style dot CSS. Um, as some, that's fine. It could be something else than CSS, whatever you want to call it. So like, let's say I want to change, you just have to have it change here and you need to make sure you connect it. So like, let's say you add another CSS file. I could add another one here and let's call this one something that CSS, but I need to connect this one to my page as well. So I would go to my index.html. I could grab this here. I'm just going to copy and paste it. I don't want this part though. <laughs> and instead of this saying style.css, I would just change this to something that CSS. So it doesn't matter what this is called, but this just has to match whatever you're calling it over here. Awesome. Yeah. Andrew, uh, let us know if that if that helped. Yeah, if it doesn't, like you guys can, um, I don't know if there are a lot of email me or contact me. You guys can contact me later if you guys have any other questions. Yeah, I can put your um, yeah. contact information yeah, absolutely. Uh, in the follow-up email for sure. Yeah. Uh, Mark wants to know, could you just go over how the div worked again? We started with the dot Halloween underscore image in style, but then also worked on image below that question mark. <laughs> so uh, for div, what are you, what, what are we talking about? Uh, Mark, do you, can you add something to the bottom of this chat? Um, I think Candace is able to read, read that and, uh, yeah, help out. Sometime. Why did we create two to work on the image? Ah, because there's a container going on here. So we have this image wrapped in this container. So it's easier to control because images are kind of harder to control. So to make it easier to control, we like put it in a box, we put it in a container. So you have this like free floating image and to control the image a little bit better, we shoved it into like our own little box that we can control a lot better. Awesome. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan said, so I noticed the fork option on code sandbox. Does that mm -hmm. mean we can save this in our, uh, to our GitHub? So the fork option here is just a forking it for this specific page. So like the way that code and sandbox, I believe that I'm not super familiar, but I'm like very sure that they have an option that you can connect it to your GitHub or use some of your GitHub things on here as well. I think that they have like a connection thing with it. Um, but you'd have to look a little deeper into that. Um, I know that the fork here is like for forking somebody else's work and opening it on this particular platform. Awesome. Um, and thank you, Ty, for being an awesome uh, community uh, person in our chat. But there was a question and I don't know if others are interested in it, but mm -hmm. could you please talk a little bit about TD and TR and their differences yes. and how they should be used if we have time? So um, those are tables. I don't use tables a ton because they kind of like there's better things that people could use. They're great for data, but it's just a different way to display things. And just like things like image tag and H1 tags, they're very specific to um, something called a table. So um, you have TR, which is like a table row. And then you have things like a like there's table headers like THs and which will be like the you're dealing with columns and rows inside of tables. And so that's what like things are like TDs and TRs because you're dealing with a very specific thing that's called a table. Any other questions in the chat? Anything else? Um, I know, uh, just make sure that I'm giving you the right information. Oh, Yasmin, um, you asked if we can share the code. This is the link uh to the code that we use um today um zaya asked how much code does a professional uh do in a day Av uh, i guess on average <laughs> um a lot <laughs> like i am an instructor here and just from helping other students in debugging i probably want to say i do between um five to 10 hours ago today, but it's like super, I'm very passionate about it and I love it and it's super fun. And I'm also dealing with a bunch of students who are helping them debug their code and going through their code and figuring out 
their issues and what's going on. Um, when you're starting out and when you're learning, it's going to be um, depending on what pace you're going, right? So if you want to go full time, I want to do this like go guns blazing. You're going to be doing a lot of coding. You're going to be going crazy, but that's not the case for everybody. Like when you're starting at Flatiron School, that's not always the case. Like you might have another job. Like you're doing this like I want to learn to code. I want to change my life. I want to do be a software engineer, but I also have bills to pay. I also have children. I also have other life things going on. Like when I went through, I was having like, I was working two jobs and going to fly iron school. So you might have other things going on in your life. And so that's why they have different paces available for you. So like we're somebody full-time that's like completely dedicated, nothing else going on, might be doing like 10 hours of code a day. If you're a part-time, it might be kind of something more like half of that, like doing like five hours of code a day making. And that's like, if you want to be like ready to go and expert on it, and that would be good. Cause that's a little bit longer of a pace. Awesome. And then um, Marzi asks, uh, I need to provide my data and code in my page. Is using TR and TD more helpful than other options? Since you mentioned you don't use either very much. I'm I just, just don't do, yeah, of course. I just don't do a lot of stuff with databases and tables, like displaying that information. It's a perfectly good um, option if that's like what you're doing a lot. I tend to partial because I do a lot more things, especially because I came from like a design background. I do a lot of things more with like images and things like that where a table wouldn't be like great for that. Um, what I recommend is also looking into things like cards. Cards are kind of like something new that's kind of like come up recently and using cards to display information. But if you're doing something like very um, like table driven, like I have names and email addresses that I need to like make like a formatting for, Table's perfectly fine and probably actually the best choice for that. <laughs> awesome. Um, we've got two more questions and we'll, we'll end with that. Um, <laughs> Ashley has a, a, a very um, good question. How do you stay up to date with software engineering trends? Um, they change on the daily. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you'll learn that one day some language, you'll read an article and be like, this language is dead. It's never coming back. It's the worst language ever. And then like literally a year later, like, if you know the skill, you're high in demand. That was the same language they said it was dead like a year ago. <laughs> um, just the way that the software and it's a con. If you're doing something like this, you better be loving to learn. If you have like a passion for learning and just like loving new things and um, constantly like learning new things, like this is the career for you because like it's it's constantly changing, constantly updating. They're making changes to this language as we speak. I actually was just teaching a group of students um, something. And while I was teaching it to them, um, it changed, like the, the documentation changed. So it's kind of like, you gotta be ready for those like live changes, but it also like makes it a little bit more fun to <laughs> getting to do those things live. So it's not like, so it'll never be monotonous. Like this is a career where it's always gonna be something new, something fresh, always learning here. <laughs> awesome. And uh, Rel wants to know, were you using the developer tool in Google to highlight the space on the image earlier? The developer tool in Google. Yes. So um, I use, it's a Chrome tool. So if we go in here, this is a Chrome tool. So if I'm using Chrome for this one, but there are other, other sites um, besides Chrome that have these. Chrome, in my opinion, is the best one to use inspect on, but you could also do it in Firefox as well. They also have a good inspect tool. The one we use at Flatiron the most is going to be Chrome. But that's what this is here. So it's like you click on this here and then you can pick something. And when you click on it, it's going to tell you all the CSS that has to do with it. And then it also you can see your HTML here. So like if I wanted to like click on this image, I could click here and it's going to show me all the CSS that has to do with that specific image or that div. Awesome. And uh, that's all the questions I saw in the chat. Um, Jose, I saw your question about when will the DC campus uh, fully reopen? Uh, <laughs> that is still uh, to be determined. I added a campus experience page here that shows all of our locations that are open for community events. Um, and just so you know, none of our campuses are open right now for um, actual learning, like for day-to-day uh, -day classes. But um, I would keep an eye on this page and uh, any announcements coming from Flatiron School in, in the near future. I believe that um, you know it's looking more like next year, but there's still not a definitive date. Uh, so sorry, I don't have uh, uh, any more information. And before we hop off, this is a great question to end on. Um, would you re recommend getting a second screen to view Zoom uh, and practice at the same time? like? 
for my needing more space. My <laughs> life changed when I got a second screen. It was like the biggest life changing moment of my like of my coding career. Um, if this, if you're interested in this, highly, highly recommend getting a second screen. That's if you saw me going like this a lot during it, it's because I have a second screen and going on. I also, I am not a coder and I have a second screen and it's life changing. It um, I'm able to follow this event on one screen and answer all of your chat and Q and A uh, while looking at another. But I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Candice, uh, for uh, Ty has a third screen. That's hilarious. That's and awesome. I've seen people with very big uh, screens. Yeah, I was before. like, I've seen like yeah, iPad screen screen. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, Candice. Um, yeah, this course. was so uh, well thought out and um, you covered so much. Um, and our, our chat has been lit up with like lots of questions that you've gotten around to. I love so, it. <laughs> um, we appreciate everything that you do here at Flatiron, including this event. And thank you all for joining and spending your Tuesday evening with us. Um, if you are interested in the wild card play playoffs, uh, let's go Yankees or Red Sox, whatever your team is and, um, have a brilliant evening and we'll hope to see you soon. Uh, I'll send out the recording of this event within 24 hours. You, you guys have a, a, a great evening. Cheers. Bye everybody.